seated. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite your attention to the book of Genesis chapter 22. The book of Genesis in chapter 22. Um, I was sitting there thinking this morning, you know, I always get something very insightful when Brother Jared gives the announcement. Uh, there's always something that he says that just kind of leaps from here and leaps to where I'm at. I'll tell you what leaped this morning. That's when he said, Brother Lucas is going to preach tonight, and he's easy to listen to. <laughs> so I'm sitting there thinking, okay, Lord, is this a slap in the face, or, uh, or what is this? Uh, you know, he's easy to follow and easy to listen to. So I'm sure Brother Jerry will straighten me out on that uh, after service today. I'm looking forward to Brother Lucas preaching tonight, too, and I pray that you, uh, you'll be here to support him and pray for him. Uh, and so... Let's, uh, it's always good to have, it's, you know, it's good to have fun in the house of God, isn't it? It really is. But today we, we have probably one of the most important, I believe, uh, subjects that we can study. And, and that is worship. Raw, genuine, authentic worship. Genesis chapter 22 relates a story that we're all familiar with, but let's begin reading in verse 1. It says, it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Now that word tempt there means to test. And remember, uh, there are times in life where God will put you to the test. He did that with his people. He'll do that with you. Now, uh, the old King James uses the word tempt, which is making a reference to that test. Keep in mind, anytime the devil tempts you, it's always to do wrong and to sin against God. Anytime God tempts you or tests you, it is uh, he's testing your faith in him. And so it says... And he said unto Abraham, he said, Behold, here am I, or here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I'll tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son, he clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went unto the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, You abide here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Now I want you to underscore that word, worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon the, on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. Isaac spake unto, his, unto Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. They came to the place which God had told of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid wood on the altar and bound Isaac his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood, and Abraham stretched forth his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon thy lad, neither do thou uh, anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a, caught in a thicket by his horns, a ram. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called, on, uh, on, called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. By the way, if you don't know what that means, that means God will provide. Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. What a fascinating story that is. It's so rich. Uh, and actually it's so relevant uh, to where we are today. Uh, everything in the Bible, by the way, uh, will relate somehow, some way to our life. And, and, and so um, I remember when I was going through seminary, one of the subjects that we took in seminary, it was a, a required course, it's called the subject of hermeneutics. Uh, that's a big word, but it, hermeneutics basically uh, is a science of interpretation of the Bible. And what they do in your hermeneutics class, it gives you principles, uh, uh, very important principles on how to study the Bible, how to get more out of the Bible. Okay, it's, it's hermeneutics there. It, it, so there's, there's a lot of principles uh, uh, that are taught to help you 
understand the Bible. One of the principles that is taught is what's called the first mention principle. The first mention principle. And that is a principle by which God indicates in the first mention of a subject the truth with which that subject stands connected in the mind of God. Now, what I mean by that is when you find a word used for the first time in the Bible, take note of that, and every time you see that word throughout the Bible, you're going to see that it basically carries the same meaning. Let me give you an example. Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, that's the first time the word grace is mentioned in the Bible. You know what grace is. Grace is unmerited favor, right? Something we cannot earn. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And guess what you find every time you see the word grace in the Bible? It deals with unmerited favor. Genesis chapter 3 talks about the serpent and how the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Underline that word subtle, first time that it's used. That word subtle means crafty. He's crafty. Well, guess what? Anytime you find the devil in the Bible, look for his what? Craftiness. Okay, that's the first mention principle, and it carries that meaning throughout the Bible. It's, very, it's a very important principle, by the way. In our text, we find the first mention of the word worship in verse 5. Um, and this passage sets the standard all throughout the Bible every time you see the word worship, what worship is, what worship means. By the way, the word worship means reverence or devotion to a deity. It, it, it means ascribing worth to somebody, okay, a person or an object. It, it, it means to describe or to ascribe worth to them. We could say worth-ship because that's what worship is. You're ascribing worth to God. Y'all, I'm telling you, what we've come to do here today is very important in the eyes of God. It has to do with worship. And I'll tell you, the most important thing you'll do all day is worship God. The most important thing you'll ever do in life is worship God. Worship is important. And when we worship God, we are literally saying, God, you are worthy of all of my love, all of my attention, all of my devotion. It is giving worth to you. He's worthy to receive all that I can give him. Now, that word worship means to bow down. It means to prostrate yourself flat on the floor. Wow. You notice in the Bible when they worship God, they did it with their whole being, right? They, they, many times they lay prostrate before God, showing reverence and obedience to God. So it is an image of absolute love. It, it, it is an image of complete trust in God. And that's what worship is all about. Well, in our text this morning, you're going to see worship, how it's fleshed out. Um, <laughs> what's interesting to me, when we think of worship, you know, I'm going to the, to the church to, to worship. By the way, that, that's important when you come here is to have the spirit of worship when you come. But can I tell you, you can worship anywhere. Wor worship's not just relegated to a certain place. Um, but when we think of worship, we think of good. You know, we think everything's going my way, things are going great, I'm going to, I'm going to worship the Lord, I'm just going to get lost in His presence. You have all these different phrases and everything connected to worship. What's interesting is when you come to the first time the word worship is used in the Bible, it's not a good time. It's not pleasant. There's some things that God is asking of Abraham, it's hard to deal with, okay? But yet in the midst of all of this, there's genuine worship. There's authentic worship. And that's what I want you to see this morning as we just kind of pull out a few things about authentic worship and what authentic worship is. First of all, I want you to see that authentic worship is obedient. It is always obedient unto the Lord. Look at verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. He saddled his donkey. <laughs> he took two of his young men with him. Isaac his son, and he claved the wood for the burnt offering, and he rose up and he went to the place that God had told him. You see that? Don't overlook that. Now, now think about the verse before. Abraham, 
here I am. I want you to take your only son. Now remember, y'all, this is a son of promise. This is a son in their old age. Him and Sarah. Sarah was barren for many, many years. And this, this was the son of, the, of their old age. Their only son they would have as far as through Abraham and Sarah. So it was a promised child. He says, I want you to take your son, your only son Isaac, listen to the phrase, whom you love. And I want you to take him up to this mountain and I want you to offer him as a burnt offering sacrifice on this mountain. Can you imagine what's going through the heart of Abraham? Can you imagine what? What? Now, now notice, the, notice the wording, your son, your only son, whom you love. You see, y'all, this is a picture of something that's going to come later. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The son whom he loved dearly, more than anything, only begotten out of his loins, only begotten son. Now, we're all children of God, but God only has one only begotten son, Jesus. So he said, this is what I want you to do, Abraham. I want you to take that boy that you love dearly and give him up for me. Sacrifice him on an altar. And so, what do we see Abraham doing? Wait a minute, God. <laughs> Stop. Well, what are you talking about? I must have misunderstood. Sure. No, 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 no. You don't see any of that. What you see is he got up early in the morning. He got everything ready. He took the boy and they went. You know what that is, y'all? That's obedience. He didn't question the will of God. Not what we have in Scripture. He, 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 he didn't argue with God. He didn't rebel with Jonah and just go the other way, you know, when God told him to do something. Oh, no. He, he immediately got up. Listen to me. Th this was a command from God, and this was a hard command. Imagine if God gave you that command. Put yourself in Abraham's place. My son, my only son, you want me to offer him up as a bloody sacrifice? Yes. What would you do? <laughs> but it was absolutely clear. Here's what God said. Go, worship, sacrifice your son. Wow. Now Abraham didn't hesitate. He did exactly what God commanded him to do. He did not seek excuses. He didn't seek an explanation. He got up early and he went. You say, Brother Brian, what are you trying to say? Here's what I'm trying to say. A true heart for God is always marked by obedience. You can write it down. A true heart for God is always marked by obedience. Here's what Jesus said in John 14, 15. Jesus said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. That's how you show your love. Do what I told you to do. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 21 says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. You see, nothing says that we are his and that we love him anymore by doing what he tells us to do. That's awesome. 1 John 5, 2 and 3 tells us the same thing about God's commandments and how we, we show our love for him if we keep his commandments. Can I tell you this morning that worship is not just something you do. Worship, authentic worship, is who you are. It's deeper than just an activity. You know, a lot of times, well, we're going to church today, go worship, get my worship on. Is that all it is to you? Activity? Something you go do, you know, check my little box for the week. That this, this is what I, you know, God, I check that. Well, can I tell you something? Worship ain't checking the box. Worship is how you live. It's your character. It's your makeup. And I want you to see that worship, genuine worship, raw worship, is all about being obedient unto God. Whatever God asks, we'll do. Wow. Y'all, that's, that's worship. Th think about it. Um, 
It's not just something you do. Like I said, it's who you are. Think about it like this. Every obedient moment of your life is an act of worship. True? Every obedient moment in your life is an act of worship. Let me give you an example. Number one, church attendance. You may not think church attendance is a big deal. I'm going to tell you the Bible says it's a big deal. That's why it says in Hebrews 10, 25, not to forsake it. Not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And he says, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Y- y'all, I'm telling you, when God's people and, 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 and the church of the living God comes together and worships God in spirit and in truth, that's a big deal with God. He says, don't forsake it like other people do. Don't let everything come and hinder you from being there. <laughs> so when we do what God says do, that's an act of worship. When you tithe. That is an act of worship. Did you know that? You say, oh boy, he done got on the tithing. Can I tell you, when we receive an offering, that is much a part of our worship as preaching and singing unto the Lord. It is an obedient act of God. Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, shall men give to your bosom. Every time, every obedient moment of our life is an act of worship. When we witness to somebody, Tell them about Christ. That's an act of worship because you're being obedient. When you pray, that is an act of worship. When you study the Bible, that is an act of worship. Every obedient moment of your life is an act of worship. You see, to Abraham, worship was not just something he went and did. Abraham was already worshiping God when God asked him one of the hardest things he'd ever asked. Abraham, this story, y'all, can teach us a lot about worship. What true worship is all about. A lot of times what we think is worship is really not worship. I hate to say it that way, but, but it's not. You see, authentic worship is always obedient, and it, it shows its obedience. Number two, authentic worship is consistent. It's not hit and miss. It's consistent. Look at verse 2. He says, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, Get thee into the land of Moriah, offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Uh, All through this story, you see, Abraham's life was a life that was marked by worship. It really was. In fact, Abraham had, prior to this, had just finished a time of worship at Beersheba. Look look at chapter 21 at verse 33, the last chapter. The last couple of verses in in, in chapter 21. It says, And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba, and he called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' land many days. This was a time when Abraham, the Bible says he planted a grove there. In other words, he's planting a harvest, and he's reaping a harvest. And he says he called on the name of the Lord God. And so Abraham's just enjoying life. Everything's going his way. He was enjoying a time of blessing and prosperity, and he worshiped God there. He called on the name of God. He worshiped, hey, he worshiped when times were good. In our text, just a couple of verses later, things turn out (laughs) or take a turn for the worse, wouldn't you say? God and his ways are not making sense to Abraham. But Abraham still worshiped. Boy, what a lesson. What a lesson in your life. What a lesson in my life. Folks, can I just say it's easy to worship God when things are going good. Can I get amen? Hey, when the wife's happy, when mama's happy, y'all know that, don't you? It's easy to worship God when everything's going your way. The kids aren't sick. I mean, the bills are paid. There's food in the pantry. There's clothes on our back. There's a roof over our head. Hey, everything's going my way. And it's easy to come to God's house and sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. But you let the bottom fall out. When hard times. 
not so quick to run up there to the house of God and sing, oh, how I love Jesus, Lord of Glory. What happened? Did God change? Now, it, it, it is, it, does that mean that when, when things are going my way, I need to worship? When things are not going my way, I don't need to worship? Oh, no, friend, you need to worship more when things are not going your way than when you do when things are going your way. You need God more during times like that. And you need to understand who he is and what he, who, I mean, just who God, that's what worship is. It's just talking about him, who God is. You, you see, genuine worship looks beyond the crisis. That, that, that's what this lesson will teach you. It'll look beyond the crisis and it sees a God who is worthy of worship regardless of how life is going. Well, that needed an amen. You see what I mean? That's how I see it. It looks beyond my circumstances and it worships Him simply because of who He is. Not because of my circumstances. You see, well, true, authentic worship will, 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 will bow down and give devotion and praise and honor to God regardless of what I'm going through down here. Well, things aren't going good, uh, Brother Brian. I've got this particular problem. I, I, I heard news from my doctor about this. The test result didn't come back good. But hey, worship God. That's the answer. Let me give you a biblical proof of that. Nobody here can even relate closely to this man. Three-letter word, his name's Job. You remember what happened to Job? In just a few minutes, Brother Ricky, everything in his world went south. Devil told God, you let me at him. And when I get through with him, he'll curse you to his face. God said, okay, but you can't take his life. And I'm telling you, he took his kids. He lost ten kids in one day, y'all. Ten. He, 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 lost, he, he lost family, he lost fortune, he lost finances, he lost it all. And then he was covered with boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. The Bible says he just sat in, in ashes scraping himself with a pot shirt or with a piece of broken clay pot. Life was bad. The Bible says that, <laughs> that old Job arose. Listen to this. When he got the news, here's what he did. Listen carefully. He arose, he rent his mantle, he torn his mantle. That's a sign of mourning. He shaved his head and he fell down. Listen, and worshiped. Well, we don't talk a lot about that today, do we? You see, that's usually not the first thing on my mind when I get bad news. Can I tell you? Authentic worship worships God in any situation of life. I remember going to a hospital one time when a, a mother was in the emergency room. Her son was killed in a car wreck. And I remember the whole family being in the emergency room. And then when the preacher walks in, the question is asked, where was God? And I am so thankful, I know I've told you this before, but I am so thankful as a, when I was a young preacher then that there was a wise elderly pastor that I was with. And he went to that woman and he embraced that woman. And she said, where was God when my son died? He said, the same place he was when his son died. And folks, that's wisdom. God hadn't moved. God hadn't changed. Can you imagine God when, when his son is being brutalized on a cross and the world turned dark, he had to turn his back because he couldn't look at that old man sitting, dying for the sin of the world. He said, Abraham, if you're going to worship me, you're going to do what I tell you to do. Wow, my goodness. Y'all, man, we could park it right here this morning. Genuine worship sees a God who is in control of every situation in life. Let, let me ask you a question. Now, you follow me. Do you believe that God is in control of every situation in life? A hearty. You better. That's what the Bible teaches. There is nothing that happens that God, hey, nothing catches God by surprise. 
This caught me by surprise, but it didn't catch him by surprise. Let me give you some verses. Put this in your memory. Put it on paper first. You ain't going to get it there until you learn it there. Put it on paper. Write it down a few times. Then you'll get it there. But mainly you need to get it here. Romans 8, 28. One of my favorite verses of Scripture. It says, and we know, not we think, we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God. To them who are the called according to His purpose. You see, all things work together for good. Listen to me, y'all. Everything in life that is happening to you is working for your good and His glory. Now, let me tell you what that verse does, does not say. It does not say all things are good. It says all things work together for good. You may not see it now. You may be in the fog now. Thing, things may look bleak to you now. But I'm telling you, he, God has a way of mixing all those good things and bad things and terrible things in your life. And he's working it out for your good and for his glory. That's a wonderful God we have, y'all. All things work together for good. You need to understand God's in control. Psalms 37, 23, I love this verse. It says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Hey, it's God who orders your steps. In our text, it's God who is ordering Abraham's steps. Get up, Abraham. Get to this mountain. Pull out a knife. Kill your son. That's what God's asking him. He's telling, well, he's not asking him. He's commanding him. That was not a suggestion, by the way. That's a command. Abraham, you do this. You say, well, that makes no sense. I can't believe God. Remember, this is a test of faith. And Abraham is, hey, Abraham is not called the father of the faithful for, for no reason. Okay? Far too many people today are looking for an excuse not to worship. I'm talking genuine worship, y'all. Genuine worship involves obedience. Genuine worship involves consistency. How was Abraham able to get up early and just go do what God said do because Abraham was already worshiping God before consistency no trial in your life should break you from consistency in worshiping God that's what this story teaches us wow by the way we're in the meat of the word this morning this ain't the milk this is this gets a little deeper and from time to time we need to get a little deeper we need to get, let, let it get down here and resonate in our hearts and in our life. Genuine worship sees the hand of God in all of life and loves Him through the good and the bad. And worships Him through the good and the bad. Genuine worship, raw worship, authentic worship says, God, this is not good, but you are. Did you hear that? Y'all awful quiet today. Some of that's hard to swallow, isn't it? Because see, here's what, we're, here's what we think. My worship is dictated by my experiences in life. And can I tell you, if that's the way your worship's going to be, it's going to be just like this. Because that's what life is. It's a roller coaster, y'all. Today may be a good day, but I'm telling you, tomorrow can go south very quick. Right? And, and so, but, but, but here's the deal. I, I don't worship God based on my feelings and my emotions. Many people worship, it's all an emotional thing. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing against emotions. God gave you emotion, okay? But, but, but it's not just driven by emotion. Be, because if my worship is driven by emotions, my goodness alive, I'm up and down and all around. And, and, and you know what I mean? I'm not consistent, I'm in and out and I, that's not what God wants in your life. Here's what God wants you to know. Regardless of what you're going through, I got it all worked out for you. And it's going to work out according to your good and my glory. You say, well, what if it means my death? Well, can I tell you? If you're a child of God, it's going to work out for your good and His glory. Even in death. <laughs> Y'all, I'm telling you, when I breathe my last breath, I'm going home. And I'm not, hey, this is not pride and arrogancy. This is just taking the promises of God at heart and face value. When I breathe my last breath, y'all can have all this mess. You know what I mean? I'm going home. 
I don't have to worry about nothing else. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, that's where every child of God's going to be. You're good, his, and guess who gets the glory out of that? He does. He gets the glory. His son is the one who paid the price to, to save you from your sin. Oh, man. Y'all, there's so much to worship God about even when things go sour. I, I mean, you say, God, I don't like what's happening to me. I don't like my circumstances. Well, you know what? <laughs> um, learn a little bit here. It's not about your circumstances. It's all about him. Well, we got to get moving. Authentic worship is also focus. Focus. Look at verse 5. It says, And Abraham said to his young men, Now watch this. Once they got to the place where they were going, Boy, there's a hidden gem right here. And a lot of times we read over it. Listen to this. Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the donkeys. Okay? You stay here with the stuff. Now listen carefully to what he's saying. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again. Oh, did you hear what he just said? He, he said, no, 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 look, we, we've got to the place where, where God said go. And he says, I will stay here with the, and the lad, the son, my son. We're, we're going to go, listen to what he said, we're going to go worship and we're going to come again. We are going to go worship, we are going to come back. Now, wait a minute. God said he's going to take his son up there and offer him as a burnt offering. I want you to look at the faith that Abraham had. And why he's called the man of faith. <laughs> why you'll find him in the hall of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11. He says, we're going to go up. And we're going to come. Oh, man, I can't, I, I, I can't tell you how important this is. It's a principle here. I want you to see how focused he was. You see, he was focused on worship. We're going to go worship. And we're going to come back. You stay here with the stuff. You see, when they arrived at the mountain, Abraham, listen to this, he separated himself from every worldly care, and he went to go worship. Wow. He separated himself from the world. He told his servant, you stay here and take care of all this. Me and the lad, we're going. You see that? Abraham came ready to worship, and he let others take care of the worldly matters. Boy, what a lesson. What a lesson for all of us today. Genuine worship, authentic worship, shuts the world out, and it separates itself unto the Lord. Too often today, our worship is contaminated and controlled by the world. The world tells you when to go. The world tells you how long to be there. The world tells you. you and, 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 and lo and behold, I mean, even when we get to God's house to worship, uh, you know what I mean? We still got these little devices and things that, that, that are, and you see people on them. And I know all of y'all ain't got a Bible on your phone. We still, we bring the world with us. And we wonder sometimes, well, I just didn't get nothing out of church today. You want to know why? You want to know why? You're going to have to do what Abraham did. Y'all stay by the stuff. Me and the boy are going to go worship. Now, y'all, I get to church early on Sunday morning. I love it. Lucas beat me this morning. And I'm here by 7.15. He's already here. Well, at least he didn't park in my parking spot. I had to get on to him the other day. I said, dude, that's the pastor's parking spot. You get your own parking spot. I'll share some things, but I ain't sharing that. What was I saying? Got here. Oh, yeah. I got here. I sat down. I, I like to get here. I shut my door. I sit down and I, I pray. I read over my sermon for the last time and, and I, I pray. And let, let me tell you, let me tell you what happened. In the midst of, I'm just going to share my heart. In the midst of me praying, the thought hit me. You forgot your phone. You left your phone at home. Y'all, I was praying. And the thought, boom. Oh, you forgot your phone. Y'all, we go crazy when we forget our phone. We're so tied 
to the world. We don't even realize it. The world dictates to us when you worship, how long you're going to worship, how you're going to worship, and all. And we should never allow that. Y'all, this is a sanctuary. This is a place where we get away from the world. We separate the world. Why do you think church camp is such a major success? Can I tell you why? You go and get those kids there and you unplug them from the world for a week and you get their minds focused and their hearts focused on the Word of God and all of a sudden these kids are getting saved every night. You say, what's happening? I'll tell you what's happening. The world got put out and Jesus got put in and some amazing things can happen. Hey, don't let the world dictate our worship. Maybe have you stay here. Me and him going to worship. You see, it's focused. And every time you come, and I'm just using God's house as an illustration. Every time you come to God's house, you ought to be laser focused. I'm here today to worship. Do you hear me? I'm here today to worship. I don't care about the roast in the oven. I don't care about this and that, what I'm doing. You see, we're, we're um, and, and so many of y'all sitting here thinking, well, man, I got this to go do. We got a ball game preacher. You see what I mean? And we wonder, man, I just, I just feel so far from God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what happens. Your, your worship has been impacted by the world. Abraham didn't let that happen. Uh, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, talking about Jesus and one of his daily routines that he did, is Mark 1.35. I love that verse. Here's what this verse tells us about Jesus. It says, in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. You see what he did? He got up early, probably before daylight, went out to a solitary place, nobody, just him and the Father. And there he prayed. Wow. I mean, you read the rest of that day all the ministry he performed that day. Why? How did he have the power and the strength to do that? He shut the world out. He became focused on the Father and his will. And it's amazing the strength that will give you in your daily life. You see, worldly concerns contaminate our worship. By the way, church is not the place to catch up on the latest gossip. Can I hear amen? Surely, amen that. Church is not the place to come catch up on the latest gossip. Church is not the place, ladies, to do your nails. I'm, I'm going to say something that's going to shock you. It ain't going to be shocking to Sister Rita because she deals with it every week. You know what's amazing? It's to look through pews on Monday or Tuesday on the floor and see toenails. Can I tell you, church is not the place to clip your nails. If you need your nails clipped, do it before you get here. Amen? Church is not the place to balance your checkbook. Preacher sees a lot of stuff up here, y'all. You don't think he sees it, but he sees it. You'll be amazed at what some people do in church. And then they wonder why they didn't get nothing out. I'll tell you why. You didn't put nothing in it. You didn't shut the world out, and you didn't become laser-focused on what God wants you to do. You see, there's a great big God up there who's got a will for your life. And he wants you to understand what that will is. And he wants to use you to impact his kingdom work down here. You can't hold on to the world with one hand and hold on to God with the other and think it's going to work out. It ain't going to work out. It ain't going to work out. Well, we got to move. Authentic worship is also costly. It's costly. It's going to cost you something. I'm talking about this kind of worship. It's not cheap. It's going to cost you something. What did it cost Abraham? Well, <laughs> you tell me. Take your son, your only son, up to the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice. Wow. You see, this worship was going to cost Abraham very dearly. He, he was called to give up the son of promise, Isaac, whom he loved. And you know what Abraham's response was? He never wavered. He never wavered. He gathered what he needed to get. He went to the place God told him to go to, and he did what God told him to do. 
he's willing to sacrifice everything that he loves. Everything that he has. He doesn't hold anything back. Y'all, that's a beautiful thing. It's costly. Uh, Genuine worship is costly. Why? Because it requires you to make a sacrifice. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Things like, let me tell you something. If you're truly going to worship God the way he wants and desires you to worship, it's going to cost you some time. Amen? Yeah. Boy, time's a big deal, isn't it? Ain't none of us got enough of it, right? Actually, we all do have, we all got 24 hours in a day. Oh, my time is so precious. I understand that. <laughs> but if you're going to do what God tells you to do, commands you to do, it's going to take time. It's going to take time. Hey, we don't mind that time schedule when the world's demanding. You see what I mean? But when God says, you know what? I, I, I truly want you to do this. Maybe he lays a burden on your heart uh, to do something specific to him and, and that's going to cost some time of course it's going to cost you some time uh it's going to cost plans sometimes sometimes you're going to have to reschedule your plans to really really fit it <laughs> and the preacher don't be going here about me reschedule yeah that's the problem that's the problem um sometimes it's going to cost pleasure in your life to follow him all that stuff has to be brought to the altar. That, that's why, that's why, listen to this statement, that's why so few genuinely worship God. Because it's not cheap. Why are you here today? Don't answer that out loud. Why are you here? Now some would say, well, I was made to come. I didn't have no choice being here. Mm, that's right. I understand. Thank God you're here. Why are you here? Are you here to make a statement? Are you here for someone to see your new clothes? Are you here for someone to see your new vehicle? Why are you here? There's only one answer to that question. Should be. That's it. Worship. Worship. It, it, it requires that everything of value be placed on the altar and given to God. Now, let me ask you something. What if God were to ask you today, hey, all this stuff you love, you work so hard for, give it up. Sacrifice it on the altar today for me. Now, remember now, he already knows my future. He knows my tomorrow. I don't. He does. So now I'm left with a decision. What do I do? Do I love him enough? Do I trust him enough? Do I trust him for who he is? God's desire is not to hurt you. God's desire is to help you. Amen? It's costly, y'all. Authentic worship, lastly, is secure. I want you to look at verse 5 of our text. Verse 5. It says, Abraham said to his young men, you abide here, and I and the lad will go up yonder and worship and come again to you. Uh, Now listen, Abraham did not know all that was going to happen. God didn't tell him how it was all going to work out. You see, you say, Brother Brian, that's that's, that's my problem. That's my issue. I wish God would just tell me how it was all going to work out. If he did, why would you need faith? Right? (laughs) Y'all, faith is critical. Do I I trust him when I don't know how it's going to work out? That's what faith is, putting your faith and trust in him. Um, Now, he didn't know how it was going to work out, but he, he, listen to me, he went up to that mountain expecting God to provide. Daddy, here's the wood, here's the fire. Where's the Lord? Can you imagine that young son? He said, my son, God will provide himself for you. Strapped him down on that altar, put that wood under him, lit that fire, pulled that fire. And 
I'm, I, I'm sure he already had it weighed and ready to go. And all of a sudden, God said, Abraham, <laughs> that's enough. You don't have children. He said, now nah, I know. Now listen, that doesn't mean that God didn't know beforehand. What, what, listen, this was a test for Abraham, not God. Okay? He says, basically what he's saying is, Abraham, now I know you know. Okay? Now I know you know. And Abraham looked and there was a ram caught in the thicket. He took that ram and he offered it for a sacrifice. And listen, Abraham told the servant, we're going up and we're coming down. And that's exactly what happened. Now, he worshipped that day. And every time you see Abraham after this, he worshipped that day. Y'all listen. There are times in life where you're going to be put to the test. Just like Abraham. Sometimes it's a big test. But that's the way tests are, right? You pass or fail. And, and Abraham passed with flying colors. <laughs> Here's what's awesome. When you go to, and I didn't read it this morning for time's sake. When you go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and you're reading about this hall of faith, all these men and women of God who had great faith and so forth. When you get to Abraham, here's what it says. It said Abraham gives you a little bit of snippet insight of what was happening in his life. It says Abraham believed God so much, trusted God so much, that he knew that even if he killed Isaac, God would raise him from the dead. Now, y'all, that's how God has always been. He has. Now, you compare that to where you are in life. Do you have that much faith? Do you worship? Let me tell you something. When you worship like that, <laughs> everything changes. Uh, there's nothing any more beautiful than authentic worship. Don't give God second best. Don't let the world influence you in your worship. Let God influence you. In your worship, and you'll be drawn closer and closer. And let me tell you what happens. God says, "You draw nigh to me; I'll draw nigh to you." And so, every situation in life, as I'm drawn closer through worship, I'm drawn closer to Him, and He's drawn closer to me. So, regardless of what you're going through today, and I don't know where you are today in your life, you may be sitting there struggling. I mean, struggling with your faith. I want to tell you, God can help you. You'll put your faith and trust in him. He's worthy of every ounce of worship you could ever muster. He's worthy. His son died on that cross for my sin. For that, I'm forever thankful and grateful. I can worship him now through eternity because of what Jesus did for me. We all need a lesson and taking our worship to the next level. And that's what Abraham showed us, how to do that. Let's sing together. Father, we come before you today with grateful hearts, thanking you for such a wonderful passage of Scripture with, that's just rich, rich in its teaching. And God, I pray today for myself as pastor of this church, as an individual Christian, that you would increase my faith that you would give me a greater desire to worship, genuinely worship you. Help me keep the world out. Father, just help me keep close to you in everything. I'll give you all the honor and glory. Help this church, all of us, understand what genuine worship really is. Father, we know that we're going to spend an eternity worshiping you, <laughs> so we need to practice it now. Thank you again for Jesus. All we have in him, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.